Hi everyone, Mark Decote here. Just a quick message before starting the show. I'll be in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on July 22nd, 2018, and I'm looking for people to join me for dinner. If you live in or around, or if you'll be in the Philadelphia area on July 22nd and would like to get together with me for dinner and discuss all things design, please email me at feedback at resourcefuldesigner.com and we can make arrangements. And now, on with the show. Resourceful Designer, episode 125, Freelancing or Design Studio, Defining Your Home-Based Design Business. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host. He'd like to grow a beard, but it comes in with uneven black and gray patches. Mark. Decote. Welcome to the podcast. I'm happy you've joined me today. Are you listening through the Resourceful Designer app? If not, you may want to check it out. You can download the app by visiting the Apple App Store or the Android App Store, downloading Resourceful Designer and checking out the podcast through it. It's pretty cool because it allows you to save or, or not necessarily save on your device, but you can favorite certain episodes. So if there's an episode you want to go back to or something you, you listen to and you say, oh, that's something that's really useful, but not right now. I might need that in the future. You can star the episode, which would favorite them, and keep a folder of all your favorite episodes to go back and listen to. So it's a very easy way to keep track of the podcast and listen on the go on your, your phone or your tablet. So if you want to give it a try, just search for Resourceful Designer in the iOS App Store or the Android App Store. Now, it's been a pretty good week for me, although I have to say, I kind of I was going to say goofed up on Monday. This past weekend, my son sent me a text message and just let me know that a game uh, he played a few years ago, he was playing a video game, Tomb Raider. You know, they just had the movie come out recently. Well, he was playing a game a few years ago, Tomb Raider. And I remember watching him and saying, oh, that looks like a really fun game. I wouldn't mind trying it someday. But I wasn't about to go out and, and buy it myself. I wasn't going to pay for something like that. And I just let it go. Well, this past weekend, my son sent me a message saying on Steam, and if you're not sure what Steam is, it's kind of a, an online gaming platform that allows you to purchase and install games really easy and manage your games through this one platform. My son sends me a message saying, by the way, that Tomb Raider game that you said you wanted to try, it's only $4. It's on sale for $4 this weekend on Steam. So I kind of went, mm, yeah, why not? For 4 bucks, I'll give it a try. Uh, now I had a steam account that I hadn't touched since 2011, the last time I had done anything with it. So, but my password and everything still works. So I went in and I purchased Tomb Raider for $4, installed it. And I thought it was a little bit fun. And then on Monday, I'm working away on Monday and then lunchtime comes around and I grabbed a quick bite. I had a quick sandwich to eat and I didn't want to get right back to work. So I says, you know what? I'll just launch up Tomb Raider and play for a little bit, maybe, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then get back to work. Well, you can probably guess by just the fact that I'm telling this story, what happened. I was playing away, and next thing you know, my wife got home and asked me if, if I had started anything for supper or if I had any ideas for supper, and I was shocked. It's like My first thought was, what's she doing home so early? And then I looked at the time, because the problem is, is when you're playing these video games, your menu bar on your computer disappears, so you don't know what time it is. I had played the entire afternoon. I had completely lost track of time. The entire day was gone. And I had spent the entire time playing a video game. Now, I had a lot of fun. And luckily, I had no deadlines or anything that fell behind on. But man, I was scrambling uh, Tuesday. I did some work Tuesday evening, a little bit on Monday evening. I wasn't able to do a lot on Monday evening, but I did put in some hours Tuesday evening. And I, if you know me, if you've listened to the podcast for a while, you know I don't normally work evenings, but I did have to catch up a little bit. So I paid the consequences, but it was fun, and it was a fun game where I'm still playing it, but now I'm going to be a lot more cautious and not start it up during work days. But that's how my week started. Now, as always, I have a resource of the week to share with you, and this resource is something that was shared by Naomi. So thank you, Naomi, for sharing this. Naomi sent me this link to this website after hearing the question of the week on a previous episode where somebody was asking about ways to improve or, or work that they can do in order to build their portfolio. And Naomi sent me this link to a website called sharpen.design. And what's cool about this website is all it does is you hit a, a button and it says there's currently 1 million 
46,808 possible design prompts to challenge you to think outside the box. So as an example, right now it says design a wall vinyl for a tattoo parlor. So it's just to prompt you, like if you want an idea to design, if you're a student or you're starting out and you want an idea, like what can I design? Well, it gives you prompts. So and it's just random. You hit this button, uh, the iterate button, and it creates a new one. So right now it says design a wall vinyl for tattoo parlor. I hit it again. It says design a logo for a Finnish architect. Hit it again. Design an art installation for a monthly makeup subscription box. Again, design a homepage for Ford. Design a payment dialogue for Spider-Man. Design branded stickers for a movie trailer. So you just keep clicking it and it comes up with different ideas for you to try. So it's pretty cool in that sense that I sat here one time just clicking, 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 clicking. Just, I wanted to see all the different things. Here's the next one. Designed four logo variants for a camera company. So this is great for students or or people that just want to build stuff for their portfolio. And you're thinking, well, what can I design? It gives you some ideas on what you can do. So if you're interested in checking it out and just clicking away and seeing what sort of things come up, just visit sharpen.design. So thank you very much for that resource, Naomi. I really appreciate it. I've had a lot of fun with it. And I think many of my listeners will too. And now let's dive right into this week's topic. Freelancer or design studio, defining your home-based design business. Now, I talk a lot on the podcast about running a home-based design business. It's why I started the podcast in the first place, after all. Just like my catchphrase that's on the website and what Wayne says at the beginning of the website, I'm doing this to help designers like you streamline your business so you can get back to what you do best, which is designing. And although I've covered many topics in the past, things like, I don't know, pricing strategies, uh, finding new clients, dealing with isolation when you're working from home, and so many more. In fact, as of this episode, there's 124 previous episodes that you can listen to if you haven't heard them already. And with 124 topics previously, I've never really talked about what options are available to you in the type of home-based design business you run. And it is an important decision because the direction you take in what type of business you run could determine the type of clients you attract. It could determine the growth curve for your business, and it could determine how much money you can potentially make. Now, I'm not talking about the direction on whether you're going to be a web designer or a print designer, or you're going to niche down. I've talked about things like that in previous episodes. What I'm talking about is whether you're defining yourself as a freelancer or as a design studio. Now, there is a third option out there that I'm not really going to talk about today. I'm taking it off the table, and that's defining yourself as a design agency. Now, the reason I'm omitting design agency is because by definition, a design agency is made up of several people, and each one of them has their own talents, their own skills, but they all put them together to work on clients' projects. And a design agency usually has all this talent under one roof. Now, some of you listening may fit that category. Maybe you work for an agency or maybe you're running an agency. But as I stated, Resourceful Designer was created to help home-based designers. And although not entirely impossible, I don't think there's many home-based designers that are running a true design agency. Now, I could be wrong. And if you do fit that mold, if you are working from home and you are running a true design agency, please leave me a comment for this episode at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 125. So that leaves the two, freelancer or design studio. So let's start with freelancer. What exactly is a freelancer? Well, according to dictionary.com, a freelancer is a person who sells work or services by the hour, day, job, etc., rather than working on a regular salary basis for one employer. Cambridge Dictionary defines it as someone who works on different projects with different companies instead of being a company employee. And the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines freelancer as a person who pursues a profession without a long-term commitment to any one employer. Now, I've never considered or called myself a freelancer. Personally, I've always found the term derogatory and maybe uncommittal, kind of like a I don't know, fly-by-night kind of thing where the client will never be sure if the freelancer will be there for them. And just looking at those definitions, the Merriam-Webster one that said, freelancers pursue a profession without a long-term commitment. Well, to me, my clients are long-term commitments. 
So that's why I've never used that term. In fact, I did an entire podcast episode way back. Episode 17 of the podcast was titled being a freelance graphic designer could hurt your business. And in that episode, I actually shared a story, a true story about a designer I know that applied for an in-house design position and didn't get the job because she, on her resume, she referred to herself as a freelance designer. And the owner of the company that was hired, wanted to hire an in-house designer told me when I said, well, why didn't you hire her? I thought she was perfect for the job. And, and he told me she did seem perfect, but she, she's a freelance designer. And I want somebody who takes this more seriously than that. So she lost out on that job because she called herself a freelancer. Now, there's a lot more to that episode about calling yourself a freelancer. So if you're interested, listen to episode 17 at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 17. Not to mention that because I have a registered business. So in a way, you can say that I'm an employee of my own business. And by the definition of freelancer, freelancer is not an employee. So hey, I can't be a freelancer because I'm an employee of my own business. But that's neither here nor there. For the purpose of today's topic, a freelancer is simply a, I don't know, one-man band, if you want. So a one-man band when it comes to design services. As a freelancer, you are everything from art director to designer to coder to, I don't know, accounts receivable, accounts payable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You do it all. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you go back to listen to episode 38 of the podcast, The Many Hats of a Home-Based Graphic Designer, you can see just how many different things that a home-based designer has to be. Now, for years after I started my business, that's exactly what I did. I handled everything. I was a one-man band. And if there was something that came along that I couldn't do, I simply didn't take on the job. And in that aspect, defining yourself as a freelancer, again, meaning that it's just you by yourself, limits the type of clients that you can take on by the skills and services you offer. If you don't do web design, you're obviously not going to take on a client that needs a website and vice versa. Now, freelancers tend to attract smaller clients, startups that are, maybe have a lower budget or especially they, freelancers attract the, I don't know what you call them, the quick clients, those who call you up and say, I need something done by the end of the week or, or worse yet, they'll call you up and say, can you do this for tomorrow? That's the type of work that freelancers often get. And for the most part, designers who work as a quote unquote freelancer tend to take on clients and jobs in the, I don't know, ranging between $500 and maybe $5,000 range. And of course, these are North American rates, US, Canada, and that prices may vary elsewhere in the world. But that's the price range of most clients that a freelancer would take on. Now, let's look at a design studio. What exactly is a design studio? Remember how I said earlier that a design agency is made up of multiple people working together under one roof? Well, a design studio is very similar to an agency in that it offers a wide variety of skills and services offered by different people. But those skills and services come from third parties, meaning they're not all working for the same company under one roof. As a design studio, you still run your home-based business just like a freelancer does. However, rather than offering a full range of services under one roof like an agency, you subcontract the parts of the projects that either you can't or you don't want to handle yourself. Things like photography, coding, copywriting, illustration, and so forth. What this does is it allows you to take on bigger clients and bigger projects because there's people that can handle the stuff that you can't handle. And everything is processed through your business so that your client deals directly with you instead of dealing with multiple di different businesses for different things. So if they need a sign, they can do it through you. If they need business cards, they do it through you. If they need a website, they do it through you. And what you do is you take on the role of art director and you manage the subcontractors. So a design studio tends to attract I'd say small to mid-sized companies, companies that may have a marketing department, but don't necessarily have an in-house creative team. So they hire a design studio to act as their creative team. And clients that are looking for design studios that will actually Google design studio often have budgets ranging anywhere from 5,000 to 20,000 or even more. Some of them can have large, very large budgets. Now, the huge corporations will often look for a design agency but a lot of those mid-sized companies, they want to deal with a design studio. And even if you're working from home, 
you can be a design studio because of all the subcontractors, those third party photographers and copywriters and such that you use to complement your business. So the difference between defining your business as a freelance business and defining it as a studio is simply your willingness to work with subcontractors to get a job done. So which of the two is right for you? Well, being a one person freelancer or running your business as a design studio is simply a matter of choice. There isn't one that's preferable over the other. I myself ran my business as a freelancer, even though I never use that term. I ran as a freelancer for several years before I switched models and redefined my business as a design studio. I now have illustrators, copywriters, coders, developers, a whole slew of people that I work with because I need their talents. Now, I don't work with them on a a regular basis, but they're there if I need them. And if there happens to be something that comes up that I don't have somebody, I will go out and find somebody. Instead of telling the client no, I will go out and find somebody to fill that role. Now, I remember when I actually made the switch from freelancer to studio. It was after I had to turn down a job. I was offered a job, not to quote or to um, pitch for a job. I was offered, they were giving me a $50,000 website job. This was somebody I had worked with at a previous company. He had moved to a new company and they wanted this new website done. And he knew what I can do as a designer. He really liked my work. And he said, Mark, you're the one I want to work with. Here's our budget. We have $50,000 towards this website. Go. And I took a couple of weeks looking, meeting with them, figuring out exactly what they needed. And then I realized that It was way beyond my capabilities. First of all, at that point, I had only done static websites using HTML and CSS. This is long before I started doing WordPress. This is when I would hand code websites, but I didn't really know PHP and MySQL. I'd never worked with a database before. I was just starting to learn it at that point when this job came in. And I still had a lot of learning to go before I can handle a job of this caliber. And although it broke my heart, after a couple of weeks, I realized that I couldn't do it. So I contacted him and said, I'm sorry, this job is just too much for me. Thank you very much. You're going to have to find somebody else to do it. And they did. They found somebody else. And I guess it was a nightmare for them. Uh, I saw the website afterwards and it wasn't a very good looking website. Obviously, the person they hired was not a designer. Uh, It was a functional website, but it didn't look very good. And it was only later, a couple of months after I turned down that job, that I realized I could have hired somebody to do the parts that I couldn't. I could have designed the website, done everything, and just hired somebody to build the database and connect my design to the database so that the the content can be filled. It was something I had never considered before. I had never worked with an outside source, a subcontractor, a third party before. Everything I was doing myself. And in my mind, if I couldn't do it myself, It just wasn't a job I should take on. And at some point, I heard somebody talking about subcontracting, and I thought to myself, why did I never consider that? So it was after that that I made the conscious decision to transition my business from being a freelance business, again, I never use that term, but a freelance business to a design studio. And yes, today, I still do most of the work myself. There are many jobs that I do not subcontract any part of it. I do everything. But... I do have a list of people I can call upon should I need their skills or their talents to work on a project. I just finished working on a website where I had a copywriter come in and do the copy for the website. There was another job I did a couple of weeks ago that I needed an illustration done and I hired an illustrator. Not too long ago, I hired a a coder to, there was a certain part, I needed something custom built for a website and I hired a coder to do that one little part so that it would work in WordPress because it was beyond my skills. So in that way, I'm running a design studio. Now, I'm not telling you that you should choose one option over the other. It's entirely up to you how you run your business. If you're fresh out of school or you're still new to the industry, maybe you, di- you didn't go to school, but you, you're artistic and you are decided that you want to start a, a design business, you might want to start as a freelancer and get used to the industry while you get the, the hang of things before starting to branch out. Maybe you're someone who just doesn't want the extra responsibilities of overseeing subcontractors. Maybe you don't want to be responsible for them because you're afraid that if they goof up or they mess up, then it uh, falls back on you. And that's okay. There are plenty of designers out there that go their entire career just being freelancers. They never progress to the design studio. 
or when I say progress, again, it's not a step up or anything. It's just a different working model. And that's what I wanted to talk about in this episode. I just wanted to give you an idea of what's possible depending on how you define yourself, whether you call yourself a freelancer or if you're marketing yourself as a design studio and tell your clients what you're capable of delivering to them. Even though they're not services you personally do, you can still offer those services through your business. So that's what I wanted to discuss. Now, I would love to know if you consider yourself a design studio or do you consider yourself a freelancer? Or, as I mentioned earlier, if you are a design agency running out of your own home, let me know. Visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 125 and leave a comment for this episode. And now this week's question of the week. This week's question comes in from Allison. She says, hello, I love your podcast and have enjoyed getting some great advice on my freelance business from it. I was wondering if you had any recommendations for font subscriptions. Fonts are so expensive. I don't know how designers can afford to purchase so many unique fonts and was wondering if a font subscription would be the way to go. Well, thank you for the question, Allison. Well, first of all, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by font subscription. Uh, Is that something that you get a new font on a regular basis, like you're paying a price? I'm not sure I follow that. What I can tell you, though, is there are some really great places to get very inexpensive fonts. One I highly recommend is Design Cuts. If you visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash design cuts, and yes, that is an affiliate link. If you use that link, then I'll get a small commission for any purchases you make at Design Cuts. But they often have bundles. First of all, their fonts. If you go through the Design Cuts marketplace, their fonts are not very expensive. I'm looking right now, and you can buy fonts like, Here's one for $13. Here's another one for $14. And if you buy more than one, you can save even more money. They have a banner right now at the top. Save up to 50% when you purchase two or more items from the marketplace. Now, the other thing to look at is Design Cuts has a bundle that they sell on a regular basis. Or or when I say regular, they they have uh, bundle deals that'll change. So this current one, there's one going on right now, which is the Professional Dynamic Font Library. And right now they're saying it's quality fonts from some of the world's greatest type foundries, 99% off for a limited time. So according to this, there's 18 fonts in this bundle for a just quick look. And if you look at the different variations of the fonts, so bold and and italics and all that, there's a total of 269 individual fonts that would normally cost $2,342. Well, Design Cuts has it on sale right now for $29. That's 99% off. And they often have these sort of things. And if you look at them, it has a fully extended license. Now, that's the important thing, Allison. When you're looking at these, look at the license. And what that means is these fonts can be used in commercial work. There's a lot of fonts out there that you can use for personal use, but they don't want you to use them in commercial work. And commercial work means you cannot use them for your client's work. But all the fonts on Design Cuts are all available for commercial work. And what's great about them is you can also use them on products that you sell. So if you're a designer, like say you design t-shirts and you sell them on some uh, online print-on-demand platform, all the fonts from Design Cuts are usable for resale. It's okay for you to, to type something up with them and then resell it. Where certain fonts, you're not allowed to do that. So here's a case for $29. You get 18 font families, 269 individual quali- high-quality fonts. And that's just one source. There's another one creative market, resourcefuldesigner.com slash creative market. Again, that's another affiliate link. They have a marketplace that has some great deals. And if you sign up for creative market newsletter, every Monday they send out a newsletter and they have a sometimes one, sometimes two free fonts in it. And again, their fonts come with full extended licenses. So you can use them for whatever you want. And they have some beautiful fonts. Now, these are not the the standard times Helvetica and, and all those things. But whenever it comes to designing, there's some beautiful fonts you can use here. So you don't have to spend a whole lot on fonts. And there are different sites out there that have. Now, one thing uh, I will tell you, Allison, whenever you are looking for fonts, if you need a particular font, shop around. There are many times I was looking, I did a a logo for a client recently, and it, it was actually a font that I had purchased on Design Cuts, but the font is no longer available on Design Cuts. And the client asked me, they wanted that font for their computer. And I says, well, you'll have to buy a license. And I looked around and I found that font available for $100 on some sites, $50 on other sites, and it was like $19 on another site. So I told the client, I says, if you want to buy a license for it, here's a site you can go and pay $19 for that font. 
So just be careful. I've often seen that where, or sometimes you'll see where you want a certain font and they'll say, well, here's the font. You can buy whatever, whatever bold, and it'll cost you $50 on this website. And then you'll go to another website and for $50, you get the entire family, the regular, the bold, the semi-bold, the extra bold, the light. So just be very careful before you, if you find a font you like, before you jump on it and buy it, just do a, a Google search for that font and see if it's available less expensive anywhere else. But be sure to check the license that wherever you're buying it from, you are allowed to use it for commercial use. Because if you're not, then you can't use it for your uh, designing for your clients. So that's my answer. The longer you're in business, the more you accumulate fonts. I've, I've purchased fonts over the years. I've spent hundreds of dollars on, on like a single font before. And I've purchased fonts for free. Uh, there's certain sites that offer them for free. But my go-to in the last couple of years has been design cuts, resourcefuldesigner.com slash design cuts or creative market, resourcefuldesigner.com slash creative market. And again, both of those are affiliate links. If you use those links to purchase fonts or anything else from creative market or design cuts, I do get a small commission from those sales if you do. So if you're going to go purchase something there, please use those links. But as far as subscriptions, again, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with any subscription platforms. Because in my mind, a subscription is something you pay a monthly fee and then they just send you stuff. This here, at least you get to decide whether or not you want to buy it. And actually, I think once I'm going to stop this podcast, this deal that I just looked at Design Cuts, I think I'm going to check it out. I'm going to study these fonts a little bit more and see if it's worth $29 might be a good deal. I'm also a sucker for these things. And I'm sure I've bought many more than, I've, than I actually need. So anyways, thank you very much for the question, Allison. I do appreciate it. Now, if you would like your question answered in a future episode of the podcast, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback and submit yours. Now, I received another great iTunes review, five-star review. This one from the Bahamas, from Dragonfly Creative. It says, Solopreneur, Tanya Finlayson from the Bahamas. I'm really enjoying it so far. It really helps when you're in business on your own. Your podcast is a great resource for me. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for that. I do believe that was my first review from the Bahamas, so that was pretty cool. I love getting these reviews. And if you visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes, it'll redirect you to your iTunes store in whatever country you're in, and you can leave a review for me there. And before I go, I just want to thank a couple of my Patreon supporters at the higher levels, Pamela at the studio owner level, and Stephen from InVision app, and Joshua from Dedicated Web Designs, as well as Ali from RunningSEO.com for your support on Patreon. If you are enjoying the podcast or if you are getting any value out of the podcast and you would like to support what it is I do, you can become a patron of the show for as little as $1 per month and show your support. Visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash Patreon and sign up today. Now, don't forget this week's resource of the week that was shared by Naomi at sharpen.design, a really fun website that gives you ideas if you want something to design and just aren't sure what to do. So that's it for this week's episode. Thank you very much for joining me. And do leave me a comment on this episode, resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 125, and let me know, are you a freelancer, a design studio, or possibly a design agency? I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, I am Mark DeCote, wishing you all the best with your graphic design business and reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.